Well, a very warm welcome to all of you to St. Martin in the Fields for this, our second lecture in the series, Here I Stand, I Can Do No Other. We've got an exciting cast of speakers tonight, Father Vitale, Lindsay Hilsom, Emma Graham Harrison, and our own BBC's Mike Waldridge. He's going to introduce all the speakers to you, but before we begin, just a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, we have a reception straight after this lecture. You're very welcome to come down to the foyer after this lecture. You would be very welcome indeed. Um, there's an announcement too about the Lem Cisse lecture, which we hope you're going to come to, but there's been a change of date for that lecture. It's now on the 2nd of October, but our ne lecture next week will be Here I Stand on Martyrdom with Tom Holland and myself. If anyone who is watching online and has joined us online would like to ask a question in the Q&A, which comes later, please email your questions to jolly.gosnold at smitf.org, and that will be on your screen, jolly.gosnold at smitf.org, and he will present your questions. If anyone in the audience has any questions, uh, we'll look forward to hearing those later. But now let me introduce to you Mike Waldridge. Well, good evening and welcome everyone from me. Uh, I saw a remarkable film last Wednesday. It was called, What Did You Do to the Russians? It was about Ukraine and it was shown appropriately at the Frontline Club, uh, which is a journalistic haunt in Paddington. It was very powerful, and it was received in total silence at the end before sustained applause for the filmmakers from neighboring Slovakia, and for Father Vitaly Novak, the central figure in the documentary, and the head of the DePaul charity in Ukraine who is, of course, here to talk to us in person this evening. Uh, after you've heard him talk about DePaul's work, helping many of those most directly affected by the war, about the humanity and the faith that sustains him personally, and about the situation in Ukraine, I hope that you too will find the opportunity to see uh, what did you do to the Russians and how you can do so will, I hope, be explained later, but it is remarkable. Uh, I'm extremely pleased that we also have with us Lindsay Hilton from Channel 4 News and Emma Graham Harrison of The Guardian and Observer, uh, journalist colleagues of mine and close friends of mine too. And if that's name dropping, I'm very proud to do it. <laughs> uh, they have both provided audiences and readers um, with exceptional first-hand reporting of and insight into what has happened and continues to happen in Ukraine. And they have, of course, done so from many other front lines around the world, too. And Father Vitaly, if you would like to come up to join us here, speak. Uh, my image of you after seeing the documentary last week is of a man who drives everything from small vans to large trucks, some very large trucks, undertaking long journeys, quite often on roads that look suspiciously empty of virtually all other traffic, roads with patches and dirt on them uh, that you tell us in a running commentary to the film could well have mines buried in or beside them, with sounds of shelling and smoke in the distance or indeed nearby. And at your destination, you and your colleagues hand over food and other supplies to families and individuals young and old, in living conditions that often seem to be not just extremely difficult, but simply impossible. Uh, we'll talk in a moment about that work, the aid side of it. Uh, but first, tell us about you, uh, about why you became a priest, and what it's been like making this transition in recent times from priest, still a priest though, to frontline aid worker in the midst of a war. Uh, let's start at the beginning. You're Ukrainian yourself and grew up in which part of the country? So what great news. Hello, everybody. Good evening. I am very privileged to stay in front of you and uh, 
what made me a priest and make this deci uh, decision, it were Vincentians who came to after Soviet Union collapsed and they came from Slovakia, first Vincentian fathers, uh, because our churches were empty without priests. Communism regime did this. They, they killed all of our priests or sent to Siberia, to gulags. And when I, I saw them, when they start, came back, and I saw them not only in the church praying, but they went out of the church and started to visit elderly people and sick people in their homes, and they were inviting me come and, and help these people. So it was the first uh, signs when I said I want to, to follow them and to do the same. So if you hadn't been a priest, what did you intend to do? Or perhaps what were you doing already at that time? I don't know. I really don't know because it was the event the Soviet Union collapsed. It was a very bad situation in, in our country as well. And it was only, you know, mafia, gangs, uh, the, the government was still finding themselves how to, to find. And I was very, very privileged that I got this gift of, of faith, that I came as well to church and... I started to like it, I wanted to, I, I feel this vocation, that it is my way between all these others that I was already trying to, to do. And you went next door, the neighboring country, Slovakia, yeah. to train as a priest. How easy or difficult was that for you? Of course, when, when I said this, what I feel, I, what I want to do, the Vincentian said, we do not have any seminaries yet in Ukraine. So why they sent me to, to Bratislava, to Slovakia? where I joined this community and I, start, I got all trainings, 11 years, years I spent in Slovakia uh, learning and studying philosophy, theology, everything. And I was ordained uh, for me today when I saw this statue there in St. Martin's Cathedral in Mukachevo in Ukraine. That's oh, the yeah. first Vincentians who were ordained. So very significant. Indeed, St. Martin. Um, did you also uh, as you were training to be a priest and when you first became one, did you have causes that you very much wanted to fight for at that time? I mean, obviously faith was, was clearly the kind of central part of your life at that time, but yeah. you were just telling us all about oh. this transition time for Ukraine from the, um, with the collapse of the, the old Soviet I've Empire. fallen. Uh, uh, yes, I've so fallen. Were there, in the midst of all that, were there causes that you were passionate about and wanted to fight for? Yeah. For the time when I get close to, to faith, when I recognize how many martyrs we had during the Soviet Union time, how many of our people who just for their faith, they had to give life in the prisons mm -hmm. or in the gulags. For me, it was like big, big power, like how it's possible to give life for that value. For just because you are faithful, you are not allowed to go to, your children will not allowed to, be, to go to, the, to universities, you are not allowed to do anything in the soci public society because you are faithful. Mm -hmm. And for me it was like, this is, we were growing, my generation, on the blood of our martyrs in Ukraine. So there was already a very real cause to fight at that time. Uh, you became, correct me if I'm wrong, you became a parish priest initially. We're talking here about the, um, the Catholic Society of St. Vincent de Paul, yeah. uh, 17th century French social reformer. So, so this was a society that was founded also very much with a cause serving the poor, wasn't it? Yeah, this was the church that you trained for, the church that you joined. Initially you were working in a parish, but then you became what is called a missionary priest in the congregation of the mission part of the church. Can you just explain that? Why you did it and, and what that meant in practice? So we were Vincentians. It's our, we were all the time going to the mission and especially to the poorest of the poor regions or countries. And when I finished my studies, uh, I was sent to the mission to Kharkiv. Why we are talking about Kharkiv, uh, east of, of country and at the end of the city, uh, Saltivka, because this steel regime that was there 1995 when we daughters of charity they were first there called by bishop because of services for the poor in that mm. part of the world we were happy our uh, as a community to build their saint vincent de paul parish but it was on the 
outside of the city. They didn't want to see our community inside the city, like in center of Kharkiv. Uh, and this uh, parish became uh, a welcomed all these people from north, south of Ka. Uh, we started to serve children and street children there from the beginning of our presence there. And as well, all communities who, especially students who were coming to study to Ukraine and Kharkiv from Africa, Asia. Right. Uh, so I was responsible. I, well, everybody asks, do you understand my English? Because I could have <laughs> African accents because I spent many, many times with the African communities who were uh, who in Kharkiv, where I was responsible for them, uh, students from India, Africa. So it was very, as well, good and gift I, for me. To I suspect from the way you're saying it, this was very much the kind of priest that you wanted to be. This was the, very much the constituency you wanted to work in. Yeah. It's interesting you said just now that they didn't want you in the, they being the authorities, I guess, want you in the center of the city. They wanted you around the edges, helping people yeah. on the edge. Exactly, and one day they came to our parish and, and knocked to our doors uh, and said, can you help us to serve the problem uh, of street children? We have a lot of street children in Kharkiv and why, how Depot started in Kharkiv. It was like, I joined this meeting of local government and they said, come on and help us. Uh, and I started to, to send this message that I, we need, we, I want to help to serve these children and help them, but I don't have an experience. So my this voice, I think my cry, came to here to the Paul International Office because here in, in, in London they had experience how to serve youth who were on the streets. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark McGreevy, the founder of the Paul, came to Ukraine and we started to say how to organize first services for these right. children. And we became a problem for the same government because they say. Yeah. You, they uh, go and they are more and more on the streets because you feed them well on the streets. <laughs> so you are going to prison, even they said to me, like, because how, how, you, how are you possible that you take these children and mm -hmm. care about them? They have families, but I mm -hmm. said, what kind of families? Mm -hmm. Crisis families, alcoholic families, they run away from families because of this reason, mm -hmm. or orphanages. So you then, you've mentioned to Paul already, which is the charity yeah. associated with the, with the society, isn't it? And you joined DePaul Ukraine, uh, which is a charity alongside or part of the family that's overseen yes. by a wider DePaul International, yes. which operates various places around the world, um, and indeed which has uh, supported your coming here tonight as well. And you joined DePaul Ukraine as its director of services so did you do that in addition to continuing your work as a priest or was this a move, uh, something separate? I think I joined as a volunteer. When I ah, finished, okay. finished doing evening masses in the church where I was appointed in Kharkiv, in the evening we went and, and set up a minibus and went to the streets of the Kharkiv. So I, I did my service in the church for our parish community right. and after that we went to the streets of Kharkiv and started to contact children where they were on that so it was and I was volunteer a driver and then the first manager local manager in Kharkiv <laughs> the director chair now I am Baxio mm. when we set up in Odessa in Kiev our services for yeah for yep. good so in the run-up to 570 days ago today when the Russians invaded yes. Ukraine in the, in the run-up to that, in, in January, February last year, did you think that the Russians would invade or not? They invaded. I knew they, that it is already started 2014 for me. Indeed. Uh, I was helping my friends who were soldiers already on Donbass, protecting our, our borders and our country. I was coming to them from that time. Uh, so I knew that we have a war. Nobody believed even in Ukraine uh, yep. so, mm -hmm. uh, and, and others. So it was like our private things. And for me, it was many, when we saw how all these uh, international embassies are leaving Kiev, yes. then I think, yes, it's going to happen. Yes. I mean, no, you very rightly make the point, of course, that there had been conflict for, for quite a few years, I think from 2014, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, over in the east and parts of the south. So 
you would see it as a continuation of that. Nevertheless, this was very different, wasn't yes, it? Right. This was on a very different scale, yeah, with the exactly. capital immediately threatened as well. But were your 572 days ago, were your first thoughts that Ukraine would be able to defend itself against this invasion, this huge new turn in the war? We knew, and we were talking about the war will start it, but we didn't, nobody expect on how huge scale it will be, how big mm -hmm. invasion it will be, from north, east, south. We were thinking, yes, we are going to operate and run our surfaces, open our doors in our, where we are present for refugees, because we knew that there was a million people, uh, internal displaced people, when the war started 2014. We already saw them in our projects, as, a, yeah. as well as our homeless people. But in the morning to, 20, to 24 of October, when we saw they are almost in front of Kharkiv, they are coming to Kiev from Kherson, it was like, at that time, we, uh, I really didn't know what will happen next. Uh, so, d I mean, did you think it, just to ask that question again, but in a slightly different way, did you think it possible that Ukraine would not be able to mount uh, much of a defense against this new kind of war that Russia was pursuing? What I discovered that people who stand for their country, for our country, for Ukraine, nobody expected, nobody had, was prepared until the end, but what we saw wherever were our soldiers and regular simple people like we, who went and started to, sometimes they would stand up in front of the tanks like in Bashtanka near Mikolayu. When I saw this the, from their phones, the videos, how they yeah. were protected their city, I said, okay, yes, we can do this. Yeah. Uh, we, we are able to stand because for what we stand, it's for our freedom, for our life, for our future. And then I, when I saw it, it started on Maidan as well, when I was there on the protest, the, the first blood we saw, it didn't, we didn't run away. There came millions. How did it change your life in practical ways once this invasion was underway? What was your daily life like then? So before this, it was normal life, as everybody of you has. And very organized, planned. I know where I have a mass, what we are doing in our services, what we are doing in our parish. But from that time, radically, because I had to first few days I just only could spend reading and then I said what I'm about I'm sitting here I have to, to ask something I remember I called to our colleagues in the Poly International because we were 24 hours on zoom at first few hours and they said I switch off the zoom I have to do to do something because we start our nation people started to suffer and I went to west border of Ukraine where we got first track of humanitarian aid and I started to head to the to east, like I remember even like many were doubting in the West Ukraine, like do not go to Kiev because it will two, three mm. days and we lose the Kiev. Mm. And I, when I saw this traffic, people heading 400 kilometers queue from, from Donbas area, from south, from Odessa, from Kiev, the, the same road, they were heading west mm. and I was traveling and, and driving the first truck east. I mean, and you, from you, that time, I'm traveling all around, from Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, Kherson, Mykolaiv, Odessa, uh, Kiev, and then to West to organize everything. Without, it's not only me. It's and you were doing much of the driving, weren't you, of these heavy trucks and, oh, yes. and the distribution, yes. with, with, obviously with other volunteers and with yes. your colleagues. All, all and my you, were now, you were now the chief executive of yes. the organization as well. So it all fell to you. Yeah, because I think that all our previous life just before the war started, the whole invasion started, it was for me, when I now do reflection, it was like preparation. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I will be truck driver, but I did this, <laughs> the, the, the lessons, the license, I got the license, maybe sometimes I will need it. And now <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. yes. It's, I call it God's providence. So I... And in all the driving at that time, uh, as you say, with the roads so clogged with people going usually in the other direction from you, with the business of actually delivering, distributing the aid, um, carrying it around and into warehouses. What were the physical threats like at that time? Did you come directly under fire in the course of doing that or bombing? 
No, it was like we, I never did this in that scale, but uh, the, the first warehouses were our churches because all system collapsed and even right. uh, warehouses that were operating two days before, they closed their offices, everybody ran away. So we didn't have access. And I remember our main church, in Catholic church in, in Kiev, St. Nicholas, it was the first church where I brought first track of the humanitarian aid. And it was the same in Kharkiv Cathedral. In our church in Kharkiv, in Saltok, in Vincentian, we couldn't get there because it was in shadow zone. There were Russian troops very close, and even soldiers didn't allow me to go there for first days. And the same it was in Zaporizhia until now, our warehouse is in the cathedral. So it was... Yeah. You said in, inter in an interview I read with the Church Times last week that you knew as a priest that you couldn't go into the Ukrainian army, wouldn't be allowed, but that you were very tempted to do so. Can you, can you expand on that? Was that really a sort of very early thought for you. I want to be not only doing all this important work I'm doing, I'd actually like to be fighting the Russians. You know, when we saw how brutal this war is, when, when I got first messages from my friends who were there, and when we saw how many civilians are killed every day, children as well, so it was like, I have to do something. What are you going to do? This, was, mm -hmm. this question was, what am I going to do in this war? Where is my part? What, what is my contribution? Yeah. And I said, of course, as a priest, we, I, we, discuss, we had very deep discussions between priests, what we are going to do. And then I said, you know, you run charity, and you know what is a charity. And now this humanitarian crisis started. It is, I, I discovered, this is my, it will be my field when I'm going to stand and, 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 uh, and put all my energy, my faith, and everything to help people who are suffering of effects of the war. Mm -hmm. What is the, let, let's move on to this time. What is the pattern of aid delivery like that, that you are so involved in? I imagine it's changed to some extent over the year and a half since that time where they've been fighting in different places, people moving to different places. So how has that developed and changed over that time? So we started, of course, it's bit, as a homeless charity. We were working with homeless. We knew what the people, when they lost their home, house, and work, what they need first of all. It is food, safe place, hygiene, access to hygiene. So we started to bring these items uh, where it was possible. And from that time, we organized uh, humanitarian cups and day centers, uh, outreaches, uh, where it was not possible for people to come to our centers. And then for now we see that this, this help is changing because all of us are traumatized and some people very traumatized. Mm -hmm. We started to gather professionals and, and give people this help in this way, social, so, social, so, so, psycho, psychological, so, psychological mm -hmm. and uh, help them with the trauma, especially uh, to help children to overcome this trauma. Mm -hmm. Children who run away from Mariupol, Melitopol, Kherson, we met them uh, as uh, internal displaced people in, with their parents in Odessa, yeah. and we very, uh, we opened uh, after six or seven months after the beginning of the war, this day centers for children in Kharkiv, Odessa, and then when Mikolaev was free and, and less bombarded uh, uh, immediately in Mikolaev. So we started to to offer these services, because I saw many times people, they said, like, we are so traumatized, but we are not able to even to eat. And when your people, when your staff came to us and told to us, our stomach started to accept the food. So we, we saw that this is as well very big need, trauma, psychological. Mm -hmm. so. And then when it was possible, especially in South Mykolaiv, on Kherson region where the war moved, we are trying now to help people to rebuild and fix the roofs and windows for those people who remain in the villages, because many of them left, but mostly elderly people and sick people are still there, and we are trying to, to, to make their roofs and house and, and repair, help them that they, have, they can live. And but it would be true, wouldn't it, that many of the people you're particularly trying to help to serve are actually in some of the worst living conditions, buildings that have been so heavily yeah. damaged 
often still in shelters underground, I imagine, as well. Yeah. So the very poorest of the poorest, which, yeah. as you say, are very much your target, they presumably are the ones who either, for their own reasons, want to stay in these impossible situations or really have little alternative. Would that be true? Yes, little alternative. The actual task of delivery may be actually getting harder. Some villages near the Kharkiv is, were, were under occupation until now. They are without electricity, mm. without uh, power, without heating and everything. So even they, uh, like one city, Tishki uh, village, people from that village, they said, we want to rename our village. We want to name our village Depot because without your help and presence during that time after we were uh, deoccupied, we were not we don't believe that we can survive, so mm. it is. Yeah. You've, again, I've seen reported that you've got quite a few instances where people who are homeless are themselves helping you to give your aid to other people who are homeless. The homeless are delivering to the homeless and um, people give aid to those who they can see are in a worse situation than them. Yeah, this is, this we were surprised. They said mm. our guys who, who have who we have in our night shelters and hostels in, in Kiev, Kharkiv, Odessa, when they saw that we started to organize as well humanitarian aid and to distribute, uh, they say how we can be part of this help. For example, from the night shelter in Odessa, they knew that we are bringing help to the, as, as, clo as close as possible to Kherson region, where it was on the front line to these villages, and they said, can we help you? Can we be part? of what you are doing as the Poland, the humanitarian field. And uh, if we usually say about, we were delivering two trucks, it means 40 tons of food every, every uh, week in that region, you mean 20 tons to, from the truck to pack in the small boxes, all was done with the help of our volunteers, who, guys who were homeless, and they were coming every day. The same was in Odessa, the same in Kiev, and the same in Kharkiv. Mm -hmm. When, when would you say you've actually been in, you and your colleagues have been in the greatest physical danger in doing this? I mean, it's an incident you will know only too well, which featured in the, um, the, the film we saw last week of uh, a colleague who actually, when a bomb or shell, whichever it was, landed very close by the fragments that came into yeah. the van, took off her leg, didn't they? She had to have her leg amputated. Yeah, Regina. I don't know whether that's the most... So it was many times where, where it was, if I'm still here, so it, me, it means that it missed me. These rockets or, or shells. And, and our soldiers, friends, they say, when you see the rockets is arrived, or, or uh, you, you hear a bombardment, mm. it means it, it is not yours. It is not yours. Because if it, is, it will be yours, you will not hear it. So you're happy. So many times I hear it very close to me, but thank God I'm still here and alive. Mm -hmm. So it is, I think that this decision has to, we had to make who remained there and decided to help people when the war started. Yes, this is the war, it's yeah. not jokes, it's not the film. There is a big risk and uh, every day. As you know, we're exploring in this um, series this autumn, um, what our speakers think about the example of the following of conscience I think we can call it out, the following of conscience that Martin Luther established and inspired during the Protestant Reformation in Europe 500 years ago. Uh, his words were, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Here I stand, I can do no other. Um, as you will know, I'm sure his teachings were about faith were seen as heresy by your church, the Catholic authorities of the day. Uh, I don't want to certainly delve at too great a depth into uh, uh, historic uh, theological divide tonight, but it, um, it was about taking a stand over something, whatever the cost, that's really at the heart of this. Um, and have you seen your work in Ukraine throughout in that light, that you were prepared to take, want to take a stand on something here, whatever the cost might be? Again, I don't understand. Do, do you also say that you, you spoke a moment ago about this, you were taking a stand. Is that something that's frequently been in your mind, that it has been actively driving you, inspiring you, wanting to take that stand? Your conscience is telling you to do that. 
to lead to Paul in a certain way, whatever the cost. I remember of what was in my front of my eyes, like a good Samaritan, what he did. And it was, for me, it was clear, like, it's my mission as well, to, to stand as a good Samaritan to those who are already mm. affected by the, and uh, sometimes they are already injured, and what we can do. I, I saw this example that Jesus showed, and he said uh, he was not very happy of those who were indifferent in that time. I wonder if there have been also, though, and I imagine generally you look back on it and you feel, I did the right thing, I took the right decision. Have there also been any moments that you can remember when you'd look back now and say, I didn't do the right thing, it was actually the wrong decision? Until now, I, I do not doubt. <laughs> Thank God. You know, it was decisions when we were thinking where to go, which criteria, who needs our help first of all. Yes. Then was to very, Priorities, very, yeah. very, I remember how many, how long we decided. We were discussing how, which city, which part of Ukraine mm -hmm. now. Because like, of course, who knows what is front line. It is normal that we are there with these people. But then when I discovered in near Ushgorod and Lviv, hundreds, thousands of, of refugees, of internally displaced people, like we opened immediately, it was very hard to decide. But we saw all these women and children from Mariupol in Ushgorod, 10,000 people. And we opened our day center for them and started mm. to deliver them aid. Because what, what was the differences? They were, those people who were there on, on East, they still, some of them had their houses. And those who came here, they were without anything. Yeah. Can I just ask you at the moment, just we will return to those themes around aid but about the religious landscape of Ukraine, because this has so often been contentious, hasn't it? And has become even more so during this war, particularly between the, those who are followers of the Russian Orthodox Church, in Russia itself, of course, but also of the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine, um, the hostility that's developed between them and their church and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, you are separate from those as Catholics or other Protestant churches. Can you just explain to us how you see that religious landscape, where you see its greatest points of tension and what problems they're causing the country at the moment? Personally, I do not go so high. What I saw from the beginning of the war, when on our uh, warehouse in Kharkiv, for example, when we opened there, there was an uh, Orthodox priest from Moscow Church coming every day to pick up our humanitarian aid for his community. And there was no question about faith, about which church do you belong, mm. because we knew there is, and we didn't distinct people, because we just wanted to help people who we saw and met. And it was like first experience. I said, are you a, which church you are? And he said, I am from Moscow Patriarchate. I said, it, it was a, th a, 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 I had, for a few mm. seconds to think, do I help or not? <laughs> and then I said, that, but who are you are in the world to make these differences? Mm. Of course, come on, if you can help and join us because we lack volunteers and go and help those people. So, and the same I, I saw like with this, when there's the, the, the crisis and the most difficult situation, I remember this, I never been the part of, of protest like when the, the Maidan, do you remember when they started in Ukraine? Mm. The people, students raised up. Mm. And it, when I was in Odessa, and I was walking with, the, my, with one guy who was walking from London to Delhi, a fundraising, and he, I just met him in Odessa. He said, can you show me direction to, to, to Turkey? I said, go this way. <laughs> <laughs> and in that, uh, in that time, I got the phone call. And they said, Father Vitali, can you come? We start a protest, Yivro Maidan. Mm. against Yanukovych and his regime. Can you come? I said, what? We need some of priests to start with the prayer. And there was not a question from which church you are. Just come in front of yeah. the police, mm. Omon, and, and small uh, mm. uh, flock of people who wanted to say, no, we are not happy with this. Mm. And they put us, they found one from Protestant church, uh, Hamburg, Father Hamburg mm. and me, two of us, in front mm. of the police and said, say prayers. 
And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What yeah. kind of prayer I should to say at the beginning? Sure. Yeah. 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 If but you... people wanted to start it with the God and in God's grace, I think. That's why yeah. they found us. Yeah. If you ran into a Russian Christian who supported the Russian government's line on the war and who took the view, here I stand, I can do no other. So in other words, a pro-Putin Russian Christian. Would you have anything to share with that person? Of course, Christians' values, what we are about. If we are about still Christian and, and we still have the same values, there will be no argue. But if there is a politic in the church, we will not understand ourselves. And I, I know some, some don't want to talk, and they don't, don't want even to start this uh, conversation. So the more government are present or politi politics present in the church, the less than those who really stand and, and, and they are faithful from the heart, you know, that is less we can understand each other. Of course, it is difficult, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. And President Putin, if you were to find yourself in a room with him, I'm, I'm likely to I don't know, I'm sure. And I don't what would you say? What do you say? Or perhaps do. <laughs> what St. Vincent de Paul said to the King of France, stop the war. It is not injustice. We stand fight for the justice. I remember our founder in 17th century, he came to the King of France and said, and he saw how many people are suffering. He found this courage to come and say, stop the war, because you are the reason of all the suffering. Right, I am going to thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, you're far from... <laughs> you. you're, thank you, thank you. Uh, you're, you're, you're far from finished because now you've not only got me occasionally continuing to ask you questions, um, but also uh, Lindsay Hilsom and Emma Graham Harris, and I'm sure we'll have some as well. Would you both like to come, uh, yes, to those two at the moment, and then we can always share a microphone in a moment. Uh, so thank you very much indeed for, for joining us and, and listening to that. And actually, my first question is, to be honest, what strikes you immediately from what Father Vitali has said, since you have, both of you, so much experience on the ground in Ukraine. You've seen so much, probably shared many of those experiences. Um, you've also been there very recently, haven't you? Back just more than a week ago or so in Lindsay, a couple of months ago, our most recent visit. Um, either of you, kick us off. And if, just an immediate reflection to what Father Vitaly Well, I, I suppose it's the, it's the taking a stand of Ukrainians, of so many Ukrainians. Ukrainians with no positions and no power. The ordinary Ukrainians we come across every day and the stand that they take to look after their families, to defend their country, to defend each other. That's what I take from what um, Father Vitaly has said. recognize in his story of courage of you know his own work and the people he's supporting on the front line the um you know that the homeless people themselves homeless giving help to other homeless people what i've seen all over ukraine th this sense you know it was a war very much not of of ukraine's choosing in any way at all you know this this wasn't a war of choice for them which makes this idea i have no choice particularly strong I think because you know we all like to think that when it comes to sort of moments of great uh, you know moral complexity that we would make the right decision I mean I, I don't know what Lindsay would say I think it's, it's very it's very hard to be to be brave to do the right thing in in crisis I certainly wouldn't trust myself I'd, I'd like to think I would but and I think one of the things that's been so extraordinary for me about being in Ukraine from the beginning has been seeing what what we've just heard about this commitment of very of people in the most 
small, yet at the same time most uh, uh, sort of Im impactful ways to, to contribute to their country's fight. I mean, we were talking earlier and he mentioned soldiers without guns. So just a couple of people who, who I'm, I've thought of. I went to Kharkiv right at the beginning of the war. The media focus was really on Kyiv. Kharkiv was actually being shelled much more because the, the Russians were sort of on the outskirts of Kyiv. They were very close to Kharkiv. And I went out with the Kharkiv rubbish men who were still doing their rounds right up to this district called Saltivka, which you, you may have heard of Saltivka. It was one of the most shelled places really in all of Ukraine. They'd, they said, well, you know, because of the nature of the job, the trucks are quite kind of heavily, they're quite heavy sort of steel. They've been given very basic flak jackets and they were just heading off, you know, places where so close to the front line, there was no coverage, you know, cell phones dropped out and they were emptying the bins. And, you know, each time they emptied the bins, it, it sounded to someone who wasn't in a war like there'd been a big party the night before because you'd hear this crazy crashing of glass from all the glass that had been blown out the night before, swept up and put in the bins. And half of me thought, this is complete madness. What, there's a war. Why doesn't everybody just clean up when it's over? But I talked to them and they said, you know, the Russians aren't just trying to take our territory. They're trying to break our spirit and destroy our national identity. We don't want to hold on to Kharkiv as a dead piece of land. We want to hold on to it. We want it to remain Ukrainian as a living city. And if we don't collect the rubbish, people's morale will be down. You know, everybody's... <laughs> Even in London, sometimes we have problems with the rubbish being collected. You know, you know what that does. And also it will become unhygienic. It will be dangerous for people. So this is our way of keeping Kharkiv as a living city. And they, you know, there was shrapnel damage on their trucks from, you know, the war was only, I think, three weeks old at this point. So it was a very real. They were literally mm. risking their lives to empty bins. And that incredibly humble, incredibly brave, and incredibly important sort of act, to me, epitomized this... this here I stand, I have no choice. I, I, I found it, I wrote an article about it. I, I don't know if that many people read it, but for me it sort of was just summed up so much of, of what's incredible about what I've had the privilege to see in Ukraine. Where do you both place Ukraine, the, the war and its impact upon Ukrainians, alongside other stories of conflict that you've covered around the world? Is it very different, because it is close to home, for us here anyway, it's in Europe, it involves the Russians. Um, or on the ground, do you find a surprising number of similarities, common themes with other conflicts, and, and indeed the humanitarian crises that always seem to go along with them? Lindsay. Well, I expect before I answer that, I just, you've made me think about the guys doing the potholes, because when the rockets come in on the roads, they create potholes. And the next day they're out mending them. I'm thinking, can we have them in Hackney, please? I suppose it is this thing about, you know, um, what people, you never know who's going to be brave and who's not going to be brave. And that is the same in conflicts the world over, I think. And also, you know, sort of random acts of kindness by strangers. And you come across that in, in conflicts everywhere, I think. So I think that on that, that human level. And I think that as journalists who cover conflict, I think many people think that we have miserable lives. We don't have miserable lives because we do come across extraordinary people. So to carry on that theme, let me just talk about Olya. So I met Olya in the first month of the war because an apartment block near where she lived in Kyiv had, um, had been hit by artillery. And several people had been killed, and she lived in an apartment block nearby, and we just were chatting and, and looking at it, and smoke was billowing out, and the firefighters were there. They're heroes as well, by the way, the firefighters, with their hoses. And it was, water was coming off the balconies. It was like a, a cascade of charred black rain coming down. And I said to her, are you going to stay? And she said, yes, I think so. And I said, really? Olya's 32, recently married. Um, she said it had been terrifying the night before. They'd hidden under the, the sofa as if that was going to save them. And I said, why are you going to stay? And she said, well, 
there's a lot of problems with the lifts in our apartment block. So um, the old people are finding it very difficult to get the shopping up. So my husband and I, we're the youngest people in the block, so we need to stay because we need to get the, the shopping up. And also, because I don't see why Vladimir Putin should make me leave my home, so I'm not going to. And anyway, she said, it's 50-50, isn't it, whether you get hit or not? Now, there's a poem about that, which I'm going to read, which is very short, by a Ukrainian poet called Victoria Amelina, who also took a stand. She could have left, but she didn't. She stayed and carried on writing poetry and also became a war crimes investigator. Now, this is what she wrote. Air raid sirens across the country. It feels like everyone is brought out for execution, but only one person gets targeted, usually the one at the edge. This time, not you, all clear. You can tell us more about Victoria, can't you? So, I mean, when we talk about making a stand, the, the ultimate price in war is your life, and the, that's the price that Victoria paid. I had the privilege to meet her a year ago in Lviv at the um, book festival, which in very Ukrainian fashion was carrying on. Um, and we became friends. Um, when I was back in Ukraine, I went to visit her grave. And I think, you know, she, everything that, that you know, she was young, in her 30s, had, had, had has a son who's 12, 11, um, and she made the choice to stay and investigate what had happened. And it was part of a stand that was about war, but it was also very much about Ukrainian identity. She was a very proud writer in Ukrainian. Um, it was a consciousness, she, she was a Russian speaker and had won a big literary prize to go to Moscow when she was 16. Um, and when she was there, realized that she was very intelligent, that, that she was basically being used for propaganda because Russian journalists kept asking her, so tell us how awful it is for you as a Russian speaker in Lviv. And she kept on saying, no, no, it's great. I mean, I'm here, I'm taught really well. That's why I won this prize. And her last, one of her last big projects in her war crime reporting, um, particularly sad given what happened to her, was the diary of another Ukrainian writer who lived under occupation, was killed, buried a diary just before he died. Victoria heard about this from his father, went, dug it up. It was an incredible story of his life under occupation, his resistance, his decision to take a stand. Um, he could have left, he wanted to stay with his son, with his parents to bear witness. And she chose, she could have written that story herself, she would have done a brilliant job, but she wanted it to reach the widest possible audience. And so she reached out to one of my colleagues, Charlotte Higgins, who wrote a, a, a piece for The Guardian. But you know, there's a chain there of, of, of death of, and, and targeting of Ukrainian writers. Victoria was killed in a pizzeria, she was just having dinner, but um, Vladimir Vakulenko was, was murdered by Russians who took him from his house. Um, and, you know, that stand for Victoria was not just a, a humanitarian stand for um, human values against war crimes. It was also very specifically a stand for Ukraine, for Ukrainian identity. And she saw her stand in the context of not just, particularly of decades, um, of centuries of Russian oppression of Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian intellectuals. There's a whole generation that were killed in the 30s known as the executed renaissance. She talked about them a lot and the fear there would be another executed renaissance. Um, and both her and Vladimir are, are, are dead. So I, I think, you know... It, you, you talk about Ukrainian identity there, and which raises, I think, a very interesting point as to whether do you think from your, your experience and your interviews and so on that we are already seeing and are likely to see a really sort of fundamental reshaping of Ukrainian identity. Um, in a way, whatever happens in the war, uh, that that will be one outcome of this and I'll bring you back on this afterwards. Um, is, is that what you're detecting, do you think? Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, I've been going to Ukraine since 2014. That was when I first went, when, um, when Russia first in, invaded and um, annexed Crimea and uh, took the Donbass. So, and the, and at that, and what has happened since then is this has had exactly the opposite effect because Russia 
has borrowed the language, and there's a lesson here, the language which was used by Western countries about genocide and protecting Iraqis from their own government and all of these kind of things. It's very different. Um, responsibility to protect humanitarian intervention. Russia seized all of that language and distorted it and turned it around and said that it was going to protect Russian speakers. And initially people were surprised, but what happened was that then you know, people didn't want to be occupied. They had not been asking for that. So since 2014, I think that there has been a, a, a growing sense of Ukrainian identity that the problem which I have with it, and I don't know whether Father Vitaly might have something to do with it, is that Ukrainian and Russian history is obviously very intermeshed, and I'm not an expert on it. I see this as a war of colonial, you know, of, of recolonization, an attempt at recolonization. But there's this wholesale rejection of everything Russian in Ukraine at the moment. Everything. Pushkin, Solzhenitsyn, Tolstoy, the lot. Just all hated. Tchaikovsky. They wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't do, they won't do Swan Lake. They're, it's just this hatred of all things Russian. And that I think is, that I think is complicated because these are two cultures that are meshed together. Go on, disagree with me, please. <laughs> I mean, I slightly disagree I with, I mean, you know, th there's, a, there's a famous uh, Ukrainian saying from the beginning of the uh, 20th century that Russian liberalism ends when it comes to Ukraine. And I think if you look at people, you know, writers like Pushkin, they are great writers, but when it comes to things about Ukraine, Pushkin wrote very racist, offensive things. Um, you know, leading sort of Russian dissidents, including Navalny, for instance, oh. you know, has has been engaged in very kind of basically hateful discourse. And I think, you know, if we consider the way we have reanalyzed our perspective on writers like, say, Conrad, you know, thanks to, you know, pe people like Chinura Chebi making us reconsider, you know, on the one hand, accepting those elements of greatness, but on the other hand, recognizing the, like, very profound racism. And the Ukrainians are sort of trying to do that work of decolonization in the middle of a, a war for survival. You know, they, they, you often hear Ukrainians say, if Russia stopped fighting, the war would end. If we stopped fighting, Ukraine would end. And so I have a bit more sympathy with that. You know, even like people like Bolgakov, who was technically Ukrainian, very complicated relationship with Ukraine. So I sort of feel like, yes, maybe there's, there's bits of Russian culture that will come back to be looked at in the syllabus in Ukraine, but I'm actually quite sympathetic to it. Like, why, and, and particularly since the glorification of Pushkin also involved the suppression of Ukrainian writers who might perhaps have become so famous. You know, every Ukraine, Ukrainian generation of writers or, or intellectuals has been killed for it. You know, Taras Shevchenko, the most famous poet, died in exile. So, Thank yes. you very much, Emma. Anyway, Thank that's you. My, my disagreeing <laughs> view, but maybe we should hear Father can I just bring you back up to the microphone because yeah. in just a second that's we will no, open. Those are actually experts and we do have one here. <laughs> And so if you, if you just... No, you are even bigger experts than me. Your, just your thoughts on what they've both just been saying about identity, Ukrainian identity, if you, if you want to, and then I'm going to open up to audience questions. I remember when first thinking about identity, my own identity was uh, started in Slovakia when I was studying there, and I was outside of my country, and I saw the, the car with the Ukrainian plates. I said, oh, it sounds like, like my, some, some of my brother or somebody very close to me said, Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine. And from that time, I, I started uh, to look to Ukraine. And I, and I said, when I will finish in Slovakia, I want to come back as soon as possible, back to home, to my, to my country. And we discovered how many this propaganda Russian, because I was born in Soviet Union. You know, I, I was born in Soviet Union when still was saying that Ukraine doesn't exist, no, no culture, nothing like this. After only being in Slovakia, when I met those people who were very Ukrainians with their Ukrainian roots, so I started to discover who I am, where do I belong, to which country, to which... I knew immediately in Slovakia that, that I'm not Russian, I'm Ukrainian. And for us, for me, I, it was this growth, why I stand when the, when the Rush, uh, revolution of dignity started. It was our identity growth as a nation. We, we, we are able to stand and say, no, we don't want to be part of this colonialism. We don't want to live our life, our dignity, what God gave us, this gift of, 
of land and freedom and nationality. And it was, I think we are now in the final uh, phase of this growing and crystallizing of our identity. Thank you very much indeed. Right, we have uh, just over 35 minutes for questions, both from those of you who are here and also very much welcome questions uh, from those of you who are following us online, I think in about the same number as are in the room. So that should generate an awful lot of questions. Um, the first hand I saw actually was over here and then over here. Um, we, uh, if, yes, if you would please come to the, if you come through to the microphone and ask your question there. Sorry, I should have said that. Uh, I'm just going to give that. And if the next person who wants to ask one wants to I sort of start making moves, please go ahead. I hope I don't embarrass myself in asking this. I'm slightly here, hard of hearing, but have I missed any discussion of Zelensky? And what, isn't he a part of the conversation? Volodymyr Zelensky? Okie doke, very good. You, ha uh, you hadn't, no, <laughs> it hasn't come up yet, and he should now. Um, President Zelensky, and I think this one for you, you, this one for you if you would. Our president. How, how you see him. Yes, how you see him. Yes, our president who became and took this leadership when the war started. As well, he had, I think he had this choice and a lot of proposals what to do. And he stand in Ukraine with us, with Ukraine, and started to be a very strong leader during this time, because I, 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 what I experienced when it is the most difficult time for every community, uh, the most we, every community look for a leader, a strong leader, yeah. because, and, and we are happy uh, to, to have him in this historical time in Ukraine. And you'd see him as a, here I stand, I can do no other person. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you also for the brevity of your question, an example to all who follow you, please, just, just one sentence is perfect in the form of a question. After you. We have a question from online here from Yonka Ozkaya, who asks, what is it that outsiders do not understand about this war? What would you like other world citizens to comprehend to become more compassionate? Thank you. For one for Father Vitali, I'm afraid, yes, because we're also outsiders. But, and then please do it. Right. A lot of these questions, and it is, I don't wish anybody to experience the war. So it's very difficult why I'm, my, I'm not able to explain and not to like to, to see, to have you these emotions or something. You, you should be happy and thank God that you don't, have, don't experience this. And uh, because the war, it is the worst that can happen. All kind of poverty and, and everything is happens in one moment for millions of people, what we experience now. So uh, if you don't know what is it war, thank God that you don't know, my answer is. But I tell you, if you, the war is the, the worst things that can happen and uh, better not to have this experience. And uh, if you want to have, so people like this are coming there and you can say more from if you are there with us. Yes, I mean, you're, you're obviously helping people around the world to understand what so you feel they need to understand. Where would you put the focus? No, sorry, to, I just, I don't know if I need to speak into the thing. I mean, obviously, this isn't a Ukrainian perspective, but as a journalist, the thing that I find most frustrating is, is the number of people who broadly perhaps are supportive of Ukraine, but then say that they think Crimea should remain part of Russia. And the idea that Crimea is Russian is essentially predicated on accepting um, the result of a massive act of ethnic cleansing. You know, Crimea's population, the Crimean Tatars are now a minority, but they were a majority um, a, a hundred years ago. They were a substantial amount, even till 1944, when Russia deported the entire Crimean Tatar population to Central Asia and changed the geography of Crimea, gave it new Russian names. And so if you buy into the, 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 the idea, Krim Nash, Crimea is ours from Moscow, which has, I think, been one of the most effective pieces of propaganda in this war, you are endorsing um, 
a, a, a horrific act of ethnic cleansing. And I, I wish that there was more understanding of, of that, actually. That would be my single sort of one point that I think is very widely misunderstood. Okay, I think I, I, I can do a couple on that as well. Um, one is I think that everybody wants peace. There's no question about that. We all want peace. But people who say the war should just stop now, just stop it now. That isn't peace because that means that large parts of Ukraine are still occupied and that is still a victory for the Russians and it means that Ukraine is, is dismembered. So peace is more complicated than stopping the fighting. And I think that the other thing which is important and we touched on this before is that I see this as a war of colonial reconquest. And I think that in a lot of the global south that is not how it looks. And that is a discussion to have but from where, where I have been in, in Ukraine and to some extent in Russia, that's what I see it as. Next question, please. We, we saw Joe Biden leaving Afghanistan and he left a lot of arms in the hands of the Taliban. They sold them into war zones. I just want to ask, Reverend, if the war stops today, what will Zelensky do with all the guns that has been given to him from America, Britain, European Union, and all the nations that love him? What will he do with those guns? You see the guns that has been given to yeah. Zelensky. I, I, I wish him all the best. In case the war stops today, which we all want the war to stop yes. today, what will he do with those guns? Will he, he go? about all the weapons that so many weapons, weapons have gone to Ukraine. The yeah. So what would so if what, the war were to stop today, what would you, Ukraine do with all those weapons? All those weapons. Yep. I Thank you. Know. Thank you. Well I probably defend itself against Russia, do you think? In case Russia wants to go home, Zelensky have all these arms, what will he do with those arms? Where, where's Russia going? Is it not going to stay next door? Is it going to move? Is it geographically it's going to move? I don't think no, so. No, we are all looking for peace. No, in but case. what I mean is that I, th I think that the, from the U I think that Ukrainians would probably say that they would need to defend their their border because Russia will always be a difficult neighbour. So I think that's probably what they would say. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed. I don't know the answer. Thanks. Hello. First of all, I want to say thank you for hosting this talk. Um, I have a question for the journalists. Um, you have a very important role um, to play in this war, and it's about communication, and you were speaking about identity. <clears throat> and I'm of Ukraine descent, and um, I'm, I know my Ukrainian history quite well, but one of the things that I note is that uh, the narrative is still quite, um, the conversations about Ukraine and Russia is a very, <clears throat> still an imperialistic kind of conversation and the role of the journalist specifically now is even greater here in the West. Um, how are you combating um, fatigue, Ukrainian fatigue in, in the media because Ukraine is no longer on the front pages, and we need to talk more about Ukraine. Like you mentioned, Crimea is not Russian. It has a history that predates Russia, the Crimean Tartars. Um, we need to be educated, especially in our institutions here. Um, how are you combating um, fatigue? And I think it's really important question. I mean, this is, this is an interesting question for me as a journalist, because you get it a lot. And we often, there's still a lot of coverage. People will ask us, why don't you cover this? And I'll say, oh, actually, we did. I mean, Afghanistan, for instance, has dropped right out of the headlines, whatever you call them. There's still, you know, I write for The Guardian, there's still, we do a lot of coverage on Afghanistan. We, we're committing more resources to Ukraine than to anything else I've ever covered. Um, you know, I think there are uncomfortable questions to be asked about us as a society. You know, are invest I'm glad that we are invested in this war, but what is... Where's that coming from when we haven't been as invested in, in, in the future of other countries? Um, so, I mean, I, I, when people ask that question of journalists, I sometimes feel like if we ourselves are committed, which at my paper we are, both personally and in times, it's really a question for society as a whole. Like, I'm not sure if it's just for us. You know, we do our best job. We're still going there. If we work for a paper that wasn't sending us, then maybe. But, like, I look around me, all the media, you know, the Telegraph has a daily podcast about Ukraine. 
uh, the BBC still does Ukraine cards. You know, I actually think there's huge amounts of resources going in there. So I think it's a broader social thing. And I, I do still think, yes, it's not on the front pages all the time, but I've never, maybe the beginning of the Iraq war, I wasn't really, I was just starting out as a journalist. I've never covered anything that's been as all-consuming as the first weeks of this war were. And I don't think it's normal or possible for anything to stay in the news in that way. And I still think there's quite a lot of coverage and a lot of interest. Thank you. What she said. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers. My question builds on the previous two questions, and it's more a global aspect. Um, I spent about three months of last year in um, southern and uh, eastern Africa, and I was very surprised at how many people who live there support Russia and believe Russia's narrative. So I spent a lot of time listening to those views, and basically they seem to believe that um, Russia was forced into it somehow, uh, incredible as it seems to me, uh, and that they had no choice, which is the Russian position. And when you look, go to many African countries, um, for instance, Tanzania or um, Namibia, or South Africa, there is a lot of Russian and Chinese TV pumping this view out. So I wanted to ask all of you, particularly uh, Lindsay and Emma, how is it that we, have lost the narrative where we have a just war, where it's very clear, but yet we cannot convince our, our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world of the justness of this. Thank you. Well, I think it's compli there's a complicated history, isn't it? Because if you look at what's happening particularly across, if you look across what's happening across West Africa, where there are a lot of coups and there's a huge anti-French, anti-post-colonial movement going on, and for all sorts of, of reasons. And so another narrative comes up, which is the Russian narrative, and that's extremely tempting to people who are very angry with what the West has done. And if you look at Southern Africa, it was the Soviet Union which backed a lot of the liberation movements, as did China. You know, if you look at Zimbabwe, you know, ZANU and ZAPU and all those, but one was backed by Maoist China, the other was backed by the Soviet Union. Those links have remained, and many of the people in power still, you know, retain that. And if one could say that the West had covered itself in absolute glory in Africa, and everything that had been done had been marvelous, and for the benefit of people in Africa and not benefit the people of the West, maybe this would be an easier conversation to have, but it's a difficult conversation to have for those, for those reasons. And yes, there is a lot of, um, you know, there is a lot of Chinese television and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of Russian television, particularly at the moment, going in there. But there's other stuff as well. If people can, you know, people can watch and listen to all sorts of things and, and make, their, make their own mind up. The Chinese TV are free. This is the thing. You have to pay for BBC World TV. Do you? You do, because it's a yeah. commercial channel. I, I don't personally think that's the root of the problem. I personally think the root of the problem is the fact that we, in most of the world, supported very unjust wars for a very long time, and that if we really want to challenge that narrative and improve support for Ukraine, we need to be involved also in supporting sort of decolonization, historical justice efforts in our country and scrutinizing our own past. Because, you know, if you're a Kenyan whose family was involved in British suppression of the Mau Mau rebellion, why would you think the government, you know, who was part of the Mau Mau rebellion brutally suppressed, why would you trust the British government, you know? Why would you, and I just think this is an absolutely, you can, yes, we're backing a just war right now, but for a long time we fought and led very unjust wars. And I do not think you can separate those things. Thank you for those brilliant insights. No, very good. I mean, do you, do you have a perspective on it? Um, you already said it. Okay. It's our, our fight is for our freedom, but as well, yeah. uh, the world, well, it is your, as well about you. How do you take it? Do you allow that this injustice is happening to, to one of, of you, of the member of, this, of the world we are building, or, or not? If we, I don't believe it's happened to us, that the, the worst case will happen to us, you are fighting for, for the world, for the freedom. Somebody has to answer after that as well, what I've done. Did I allow it? I was indifferent. Uh, because uh, yeah. uh, why we have a lot of support? Because we, we, didn't, we, were, we are not aggressor. We stand for our lives, for our home. Good. 
Thank you. A very interesting question, actually, and there are a lot of realignments going on, a lot more to come, I suspect. And they're certainly not all pro-Russian, simply by virtue of a greater distancing from the West. That's worthy of another evening in itself, I think. But your question. Uh, Father Vitali, I'm so thrilled to hear you and to see you. Um, I'm an Anglican Vincentian priest. Oh, and, colleague. Uh, it's very lovely to hear the uh, Vincentian inspiration for all your work. And um, just looking around and sensing the uh, support and love and admiration just in this church for you, um, I wonder if I can ask a question. Um, we pray for justice and the return of peace uh, and integrity to Ukraine at our mass every day. But there you are doing all your hard work. Most of us um, can't emulate the wonderful work that journalists do uh, or provide a huge amount of, uh, of um, necessary help for you. But for a faithful priest helping the poorest of the poor in Ukraine, what can people like us best do, in your opinion, to help you? If you know how to pray, pray, and pray more. And if you know how to, 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 to raise awareness about Ukraine, about our suffering and what we need, please do this. You know this, how to do. It was the same like my bishop said all the time, the same verse, you know, what you know to do the best during the war, do the best. So, and it, it, people say like, when I meet our soldiers, many times they say like, we have good weapons, but when we start to pray, we, we believe more to this. And they say, many times they say, even we do not have to pray. We bite our lips during the whole night in front on, on the zero point where we are fighting. But uh, if you, many times they say to me back and say, Father Vitali, don't come to us to see us because you know where is your place. Charity and church. Stand there on the knees because we don't know how to do this. You know the better. And I'm very thankful for every kind of prayer and support from this church, from all communities. Because I know from the beginning of the war, even this St. Martin Church and community is praying for us every day and, and supporting us. So I, I use this opportunity just to humbly thank you, all of you who are doing this for us. Because you know what is important for people, and you visited this, not only the food box, but if you ask, if you, they see that you have interest that you ask, how are you? And you come and say, I pray, I remember about you. Many people, when they, they come and bring help, they, they don't ask, will you bring again this sausage or cans of, 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 uh, of, of fish? But will you come back again? This is the most important for those people, that somebody remains for them and stay with them. And you are doing this in prayers, you are doing this in the donations, with the phone calls, messages, with... You, you stand with us as well in your own way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another online question? Yes, we have a question from Oliver who asks, how concerned are the panelists that the United States may lose its appetite to continue to provide expensive military aid to the Ukraine, especially if Trump is elected president again in 2024? And what impact will that have on Ukraine's ability to defend itself? <laughs> it is next year. I, I don't know if you will be still alive next year, but today it has not happened. And if it is happened, nobody knew what will, what will happen 24-02-2022. And uh, we never believed that what kind of support of all the world we receive. And you are still with us, so. I still believe in God and God's providence. So not only Trump is deciding and Putin in this world and have the last world. The last world has. <laughs> and we might just mention President Zelensky for the second time this evening. He is in America this week, if not tonight even. Yeah. Yes. I know it's for the UN General Assembly, but uh, I imagine you'll have a word with the White House. Right. <laughs> a very quick question. Are what we are seeing in the occupied areas, uh, Russian occupied areas, are we really witnessing a genocide? And if so, 
are you, do you see yourselves as witnesses to it, and how does that make you feel? Is it, gen is it genocide? Genocidio. In many, in many things what we saw in Izum, near Bucha, in Kherson, it is, we, there are all signs, many signs of this. I think it's very complicated. I have, I have been an eyewitness to genocide. I spent a lot of time in Rwanda. I think that I do not know whether what is happening in Ukraine meets the legal standard of genocide. And I'm just a journalist. But there are, one of the things which is extraordinary about this war is the way it's being documented. And there are war crimes investigators everywhere. And in Izum, which is the place you mentioned, which I went to shortly after the Russians were driven out, uh, we went in with the war crimes investigators and they were exhuming the graves and they were, they were doing all the extraordinary work that is needed to establish that. And so if it is genocide, I have no doubt that we will find that out and I have no doubt that that will be tested in a court of law. Okay, next question, Great. please. Um, I'm a humanitarian aid volunteer in Ukraine and I go to all the frontline villages and I support frontline military units. And when I'm back in the UK, I attend Quaker meetings. And yesterday we were discussing the peace testimony and it struck me that I am politically very naive because Putin has now been charged with uh, war crimes under the Geneva Convention. Does that mean that um, any country or any nation which is signed up to the convention now can't broker peace with Putin because they would be obliged to arrest him if they were in the same room as him? I, certainly he can't travel outside of Russia, Belarus without risking arrest. But I don't think that he would be the person who would be doing the negotiations. The negotiations would be done by somebody more junior than him. So I think that if there was a point where you could get to some kind of a peace deal, um, if there were, and I don't know whether there will be, and I don't know when, when um, I, they would find a way around it put it that way, they would find a way around it. Because you think that, you know, I understand it's the other way around, that when you look back at Bosnia and the Dayton Accords were done and then Karadzic and Milosevic and Mladic were all indicted afterwards. Um, so it was that way, it was that way around. But there would be a way. Um, I'd like to ask a question to Father Vitali. Uh, there's a saying that there is no atheist on a battlefield I want to ask, in Ukraine, has the war strengthened people's Christian faith or has it weakened it? Has it made people more ready to embrace the, the, the way of Christ or, or have they felt that God has abandoned them when they've been suffering so much? And the second part of the question is, how can the Christian message help people not to respond to the evil that has been done to them with equal brutality. I just share my own experience from our parish in Kharkiv, Saltovka, North Saltovka, St. Vincent de Paul Parish, I mentioned already. Almost 80% or 90% at the beginning when the war started and it was very close. All our parishioners ran away from Kharkiv. Most of them are still in the Europe, in many different countries. And we, we have doubt this with the fathers. For what reason is this building now? The building, the church doesn't have a reason to stay without parishioners. But we discovered, like God's providence, 140 pe 40 people were under the church, covering themselves. They were maybe not believers, did it without faith, orthodox. When the bombardment finished, they ask me, Father, come on and pray with us. We don't know how to pray in Catholic rites, but have a prayer. So we started to pray and have a mass under the church with them. I remember children of these people, they said, who is this, who is this? They even didn't know who is the priest. And one, and one small uh, girl thinks, look at this, God came to us. God came to us. <laughs> it was she couldn't have a, she didn't have any word who it is. And then we moved, when the, the, the shelling stopped, we went up 
to the church. Now it is again the full church every Sunday Mass, not of traditional Catholics community, but those new who came and said, you save and help us to overcome the most difficult time. Physically, you were helping us. Now they're asking, help us to save our souls. So this is my, my experience. And I just came from front line from near the Bakhmut, and there was a soldier who said he's atheist. He doesn't believe at all. But then he said, look at this, what's happened to me. He, was, he got a bullet to, uh, and, and what stopped his, uh, and saved his life, it was a prayer book, Christian prayer book that he had there. So we had the like experience, like why you are, if you're atheist and you don't believe you have this book with you on the front line. Said, oh, maybe it still helps. <laughs> <laughs> and it helped. He tamised him as tamised him all this. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yeah. Good evening. Um, with great respect to your two earlier answers uh, about how people can help and to the comments from the two journalists, uh, I'm just an ordinary person. And uh, when I see TV reports or read something wherever I read it, uh, I've met a couple of Ukrainians purely by chance in a training center. Um, and. Uh, even though I see these things, read these things, hear from them, I, I, I don't feel that I understand um, the Ukrainians' people suffering well enough to be able to sympathize as much as I'd like to sympathize. Uh, so your point about I really hope nobody experiences war, of course I understand and I agree with. Um, and you say pray and think about them and support them. For me, as an ordinary person, I'm not brave enough to go down to the front lines and help on the front lines. And so the only way I feel I can help is, or show sympathy or show support is if I happen to meet a Ukrainian and, and express my sympathy. But can you give me an answer about if, if I don't feel I know enough about it, even though I read and listen, uh, where I'm missing understanding the suffering? Can I just ask you, are you, making, are you making a distinction between Ukraine and Ukraine's war and other conflicts? Are there some other conflicts or disasters no, I'm, where you well, feel a yes, greater empathy? Yes, uh, in the bigger did? picture, but tonight we're discussing Ukraine. Hmm. So uh, that was that point. And the other point, very quickly, if I could just make it, is uh, you mentioned trauma. You mentioned children. Uh, <coughs> there must be unbelievable amounts of... Uh, people who are children, women, men, everybody, who's suffering from trauma. What would you, as a Ukrainian, what would you like most of all from your international friends now and in the future, whether that be government or ordinary people, how could government or people best help your citizens, your fellow citizens, deal and recover from that trauma. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think that first of all, how they can help as well to listen many, what we <laughs> were happy to see to, to get advice. And for example, CAFOT representatives are here with us when they share us experience from different country where they have services for people in the conflicts, in the wars, and they trained and showed us how we can do better and respond to these needs because we first, I met first time this like war trauma. I didn't know what to do. When I started to listen, our international colleagues from London, from CAFOT, we set up very quickly the first mobile team to go around the villages and to work with children. We set up day center, we went to bomb shelter and we tried with this cell help, we took out these children and people who were traumatized and sitting physically and psychologically. So I think the international community has a lot of experience and uh, how to help government to set up all these programs and our sector, NGO and faith sector, we are there and we are ready to help if they will share and contribute this responsibility. It is about civil society. You know, if we care about each other uh, with a little help and knowledge, we can do this.
and you have a lot of expertise here. What, when I, uh, every time I come here, I bring a lot from, from you, from your experience as well. Okay, any more? Yeah. No, well, we're obviously doing a lousy job. Um, if you, our stories don't make you understand the suffering of Ukrainians, because that is what we report on all the time. But I think that one of the things that's very important is not just to rely on journalism. There are songs, there is poetry, there is history, there is so much. And I think that, and maybe your own profession, people from your own profession who are Ukrainians, there are so many different ways, I think, to, to understand what's happening in Ukraine, and journalism is only one of them. Thank you. I just say, I think you do a very fine job <laughs> as journalists. <laughs> Ian. Uh, thank you. Um, with the deepest respect um, to the speakers, I, and I know that this is a talk and not a debate, but we do seem to be looking at this through just one end of the telescope. And, I mean, it has been hinted at this evening, but the incorporation of Ukraine into the European Union and into full membership of NATO could be regarded as a very aggressive act. Russia is a very large country. It is very hard to defend. It is very flat. It has suffered two devastating invasions in the last 200 years. And I just wonder if that needs to be brought into the discussion and that Russia has a right to self-defense. I think, I, I think it's a very good point that you raise. And I think that the right to self-defense is there. I don't think that the right to invade another country is there. And I think that what the Russians did was invade Ukraine. Now, there are always geopolitical reasons and historical reasons why countries invade other countries. And I think that um, Russia's you know, position, his, its geography, as, as you explained so well, definitely explains some of what, ha what has happened or what they have done. But I don't think that that gets us away from this being a war of aggression, a war of aggression that started in 2014 when they first um, went into Ukraine. So I think that's the, the problem with that, with that argument. And at the moment, Ukraine is not a member of either the EU or NATO. And when there was discussion about Ukraine having a say within NATO, there was a discussion of Russia having it as well, because this was back in the, the 90s, in the, in the time when uh, relations between the, the West and, uh, and Russia were better than they are today. So although I think that your, your points are, are well made, and, and I take them. And I think that there is a problem in our coverage in the sense that because we can't get into Russia, most of us are banned, and we can't get into the, um, into the areas which are occupied by Russia because we're banned from there as well. So there, I don't think our coverage is biased. I think our coverage is honest. But I do think our coverage is incomplete for that reason. There's nothing, you know, I did a story last time I was there about mothers weeping over their sons who had been killed in Ukraine. Oh boy, would I have loved to have gone to Russia and done a story about mothers weeping over their sons who had been killed on that side. I really want to know what they feel and think about it as well. But I can't because we're not allowed to go there and because Russian reporters aren't allowed to report that either. So that I think is some of the, the problems that we have there. I agree with everything that Lindsay said, but I think it's also important to note that it's not just that we can't go there, it's that Russia is actively hostile to any kind of independent reporting, whether that's by Russians or by international press. Uh, probably most people here have heard of Evan Gershkovitz, uh, the Wall Street Journal reporter who is in prison for being a reporter who's been jailed by Putin. All the independent Russian outlets like Medusa and things like that. Um, you know, I, I echo everything Lindsay said, but I also think that, you know, 
if, if Russia has such a, a great uh, position, why is it not letting people in to report it? There's a few, you know, there's a couple of journalists who stay, but it's an incredible risk, and there's many of us who can't go. And, um, you know, I would also say that I, I find it very interesting the people who are most enthusiastically making this argument that Russia needs to do it for self-defense do not include the Russians themselves. You know, Putin's been very clear that his reason for this um, invasion is a, a purely colonial one that he does not think that Ukraine exists or has the right to exist as a country and I think sometimes you you know you have to be careful with dictators they often say things they don't mean but I think sometimes you should look at what they say and you know his argument for this war is an entirely colonial one uh, you know coming back to what Lindsay said earlier mm. thank you very much indeed um, have you another question yeah it's okay. all done I think we're on the other. There's no. Yeah, you need to come to the microphone, please. Very last Our question. Friend My friend was a journalist. I think what the old man was trying to say is that any time we in the West, uh, it's a fact. What the old man was trying to say is, any time we come up with any idea that is contrary to who the world is supposed to be, we use it to suppress Russians. Napoleon did it. He failed. That lunatic Hitler did it, he failed. This whole thing that Russia is trying to say he doesn't want in his country, why do we have to go to his border? When the Berlin Wall was coming down, we promised the, the Russians we would never come to them because they lost, they lost about 30 million of their citizens trying to prevent Hitler from coming to their land. Why are we trying to get so close to their border? That's what that old man is trying to say. Thank you. Well, well made point about World War II and certainly um, when I was in Crimea in 2014 it was a discussion I had with many Russians about, you know, about the fact that we had fought on the same side against the Nazis and that is a very important history. I think you're absolutely right about that. I don't think it justifies a war of aggression now. Well, and also let's, let's remember that the USSR began World War II happily making a pact with the Nazis. So, you know. May I just add to what the panelists said about the, the um, sort of, if you like, Europe versus Russia. It's Europe, Ukraine's membership of the EU is by no means a done deal. And in fact, if you talk to a lot of Ukrainians who are university students or sort of, you know, under the age of... 30, they're not necessarily all convinced that they want to be part of the EU. As far as they're concerned, Ukraine is a wonderful independent country and that's all they want, independence. Their eye isn't necessarily on the EU ball. And with that, thank you very much indeed. I want to say thank you very much indeed to Father Vitaly Novak and to Emma Graham Harrison and Lindsay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think we've all been very fortunate tonight to have heard this discussion. Father Vitali, thank you for coming. Thank you to um, DePaul International and DePaul Ukraine for bringing him over to speak for us tonight. It's so powerful and inspirational where we hear directly from you. And what wonderful journalists too who've shown such courage in their own reporting. Lindsay and Emma and Mike, thank you so much. I think we've all been deeply moved. If you'd like to join us downstairs straight away afterwards, we're meeting in the foyer downstairs. There is a glass of wine or a, a, a soft drink, if you prefer. Downstairs, there are some books on sale. There's a chance to meet with Father Vitali. He's going to be with us for the next half hour, and uh, uh, Emma and Lindsay as well. So do join us. Do join us again next week, as I said, for Tom Holland, the... Uh, podcaster who's written so many great pieces of history and is uh, well known for the rest is history. Tom Holland talking about martyrdom and myself talking about 
seven men that I knew who have become martyrs of the Anglican Church in 2003. The following week, we have uh, uh, our very own Ken Loach uh, talking about the voice of the voiceless and his latest film just coming out next week called The Old Oak Tree, which is about immigration in this country. A really very, very powerful film. But can I tell you that that lecture with Len Cisse is now on the 2nd of October. It's moved from its November date. It's on the 2nd of October. Lem Cisse, the wonderful uh, poet, talking about identity, what it means to be black in this country, what it means to grow up, searching for your identity, and to become such a creative voice for our nation. Do come and hear Lem Cisse as well. There are evaluation forms to fill in. Please fill in those evaluation forms. It helps us when we're planning this lecture series and our topics. Do come back again. All of you are welcome. And thank you to our online audience. Thank you for those wonderful questions tonight. Thank you all. Mike, Lang Mike Waldridge himself. Last name so plus.